I'm really excited for today's beer. Yet another establishment in the English beer kick that I've been on. This is a British golden ale. It's not a bitter. It's not really a traditional historical style or anything. It's just more of a modern British style of beer that is absolutely perfect for spring. And that's why I'm brewing it right now. The British golden ale essentially is like an English take on the American pale ale. So we're talking a pale ale with a lot of hop character and presence in the modern sense with English ingredients being the emphasis. It's actually a really cool style and something that I think a lot of people actually unintentionally are making when they're making American pale ales. I can't tell you how many times I have heard somebody say, I love making an American pale ale with Maris Otter because it's so much fuller and it tastes more malty. You take that recipe and then you add some English ale yeast on top of that and you've got yourself a British golden ale. I think personally, it's a great beer for spring. It's gonna be something that's really fun to serve out of the beer engine because I have yet to serve a more modern hoppy beer off of the beer engine. And having had British golden nails on cask when I was in England a couple years ago, it is absolutely amazing what it does to the hops. And I'm excited to try it on my own. Before we jump into the recipe, I'd like to thank a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer. They're the ones who sent me the ingredients that I need for the batch of beer, so be sure to check them out. If you're looking for the ingredients for this beer, you can definitely find everything you need on their website. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, who make the system that I'll be brewing this particular beer on. I'm gonna be using their 10 gallon, 240 volt system. Really simple on the grist, it's 10 pounds of Maris Otter, 100% Maris Otter. It has that extra kind of kilning to it, that extra toast toastiness, breadiness that you want to give yourself a little bit more of a traditional English malt backbone. For the hops in this beer, we're gonna be hopping this very similarly to what I would do for an American pale ale. Um, but with this, it's actually 48 IBUs, which is on the upper end of the scale for British golden ale. So we're gonna be starting out with one ounce of East Kent Goldings, traditional English hop at 60 minutes to bitter. That's gonna give us about 17 IBUs. And then we're gonna go on for one ounce of East Kent Goldings at 20 minutes for about 11 IBUs one ounce of East Kent Goldings at 10 minutes for about seven IBUs, one ounce of East Kent Goldings at five minutes for five IBUs. And then lastly, we're gonna do a Whirlpool hop stand basically uh, for about 20 minutes at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's going to be with three ounces of Cascade. And this should actually get us about five or six IBUs uh, to round the whole thing out. But that Cascade character is gonna blend with the East Kent Goldings in a really, really cool way, I think. I have yet to use these two hops together and I'm really excited to see what it does. There's no dry hop in this one. I mean, you could certainly dry hop it if you want to. It would add a whole new character to the beer. Um, but for my purposes, I just want this beer to be done relatively quickly. And as such, I'm going to be avoiding a dry hop. The water profile I'm going for today is gonna be a little bit more heavy on the minerals. We're going to be uh, focusing on a little bit higher sulfate to chloride ratio, not quite two to one, but close uh, to get us a little bit more brightness out of those hops, but not too much to avoid taking away the malty character of the beer. We don't want to finish this too dry and the yeast choice I'm going to be using is going to help us with that, but the water profile is going to help pop the hops out a little bit more and make them a little bit more apparent, I think. And so we're going to be using a water profile of 60 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 21 parts per million of sodium, 73 parts per million of chloride, 115 parts per million of sulfate, and 16 parts per million of bicarbonate. In order to get that water profile, I'll be starting out with about eight gallons of reverse osmosis water, and I'll be adding to that three grams of calcium chloride, one gram of sodium chloride, three grams of Epsom, and four grams of gypsum. For the yeast on this particular beer, uh, I chose one of my favorite English yeasts that I think is gonna work pretty well here, actually, the Fuller strain. So this is Y-Yeast 1968 London ESB. This particular strain, number one, is going to flocculate out very, very fast. It's gonna clarify the beer naturally on its own without too much effort, and that's something that I definitely want out of the beer. It's also gonna help emphasize the nice malty character of Maris Otter without overdoing it. Um, it's going to be a medium attenuator. We're going to get, I think, a really nice residual flavor at the end of the process, but still have plenty of hop character in there, and I think it's really the perfect yeast for the job. And then lastly, for the mash in this one, um, I'm gonna be doing another overnight mash. So we're gonna be mashing this one overnight at 152 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The reason I'm doing it is because I'm very limited on time and I can't really sit down for six or seven hours to do a full on brew day. I have to split it up in the middle and that's where the overnight mash comes in. So if you want to mash this one at 152 for like an hour or less, if you want to, that's totally fine. There's no real discernible difference that I found between overnight mashing and a standard length of mash. I'm really excited for this beer. It should be perfect for spring. It should be nice and crisp and just so much fun to drink. And uh, coming in at roughly five or so percent, I think it's just gonna nail it. So I'm really excited to brew this. Let's go ahead and do that. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the mash temperature of 152 Fahrenheit. As this was going on, I milled out all of my grain, I measured out all the water salts and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. And once I reached that target mash temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill and broke up all the clumps and got it all recirculated nicely. I let it recirculate for about 10 minutes before measuring the pH and found it to be a pleasantly on target 5.3. Uh, so I didn't do anything to adjust the pH for it. Then I turned off the pump and I left the uh, temperature setting to 152 degrees and then left it overnight. I came back the next morning, pulled out the grain basket, let that drain for about 15 minutes, and then I also raised up the temperature of the wort to a temperature right below boiling while the grain basket was draining. Once I reached the full boil, I added my first ounce of East Kent Goldings at 60 minutes for the bittering addition, and I let the boil continue for another 40 minutes before adding in one more ounce of East Kent Goldings at the 20 minute mark. At the 10 minute mark, I added in one more ounce of East Kent Goldings, and then also added in some World Flock and yeast nutrient. At the five minute mark, I chucked in one more ounce of East Kent Goldings and then let the boil continue for the last five minutes before ending it. At this point, I knocked out only to uh, about 180 degrees to start the Whirlpool. Then I added three ounces of Cascade and let it circulate through the Whirlpool for another 20 minutes at 180 degrees. Once the Whirlpool was done, I chilled in a single pass through my Counterflow Chiller and into my Brewbuilt X2, where I dropped everything down to a pitching temperature of about 65 degrees. Uh, the fermentation temperature was higher, but the, I like to pitch a bit lower. Then I pitched in my yeast, the Weiss 1968 London ESB, and left it to ferment. Lastly, I pulled a sample for an original gravity measurement and I found my OG to be exactly on target at 1050. So for the fermentation on this beer, as I've said many other times with my other English ales recently, there's so much variety in English yeast that you could do so many different things with a beer if you want to. Uh, what I am gonna be doing, if you wanna copy it perfectly, is going to be using a London ESB yeast. This is the Fuller's strain, so if you're not using Weiss 1968 like I am, then I'd recommend looking at White Labs WLP002 or uh, Lalamand London ESB is the same thing. Also Imperial Pub is the same strain if you wanna get it from Imperial. Either way, this is going to be a yeast strain that's gonna drop out very, very fast. It's gonna create a very bright beer very quickly. It's gonna leave a nice residual maltiness, but a little bit of fruitiness there to kind of push the hops out a little bit as well. It's a good balanced English ale strain and it will almost always deliver great results results in my experience. If you want to go a little bit more on the malty end, go for the Windsor strain. If you want to go a little bit more on the dry end and get a little bit more hop expression, go for a dry English ale strain or the Nottingham uh, strain as well. And of course, if you want to go with something super fruity, way out of left field, um, and a really, really fun character that plays really well with hops, go with Weiss 1469. Uh, this is the Timothy Taylor strain, which is also the Yorkshire Square strain, if you happen to find it from a different manufacturer. There's a lot you can do with it. Just do your research on your strains, try to figure out what exactly you want out of the beer and how the yeast can complement the beer and give you what you want as the final piece of the puzzle between hops, malt, and water. Keep in mind that English strains typically ferment a little bit less of that complex sugar, so you could expect a little bit higher of a final gravity uh, on your beer relative to using an American ale yeast. 
You can also expect a little bit more fruitiness out of them. You can expect a little bit more diacetyl out of them as well. So if you're fermenting them at a standard uh, ale fermentation temperature like 68 degrees like I am, definitely expect that fruitiness and diacetyl to show up. So make sure you're taking care of your fermentation and giving it enough time to clean those byproducts up after the primary fermentation has completed. So what my recommendation is for this one is to ferment this one for about one to two weeks, probably a little bit longer to give it some time to clean up those extra uh, flavors that you're going to get out of the yeast and the fermentation. After that, of course, feel free to cold crash package condition. Um, if you're going to be like me and you're going to do this one as uh, semi cask style and do it off of a beer engine, I would highly recommend naturally carbonating your keg with a little bit of priming sugar, letting the residual yeast in there re-ferment that, create some carbonation. I would recommend a relatively low amount of carbonation for this one. Give it a few weeks to condition in the keg, uh, and then you could put it on a beer engine, or you could put it on a regular tap and serve it that way as well. I would advise you not to ferment this one under pressure. Uh, the reason for this is because the esters that we get from English ale yeast typically are going to blend very well with certain hops, especially East Kent Goldings and definitely Cascade. And these things together are going to create a very nice flavor palette. And if you ferment them under pressure, there's a good chance that you're going to limit the amount of esters that the yeast produces. That being said, there's certainly a case for fermenting under pressure because of the huge Krausen that English yeast typically creates. Um, and it can get out of control very quickly um, and create a mess. So if you ferment under pressure, you'll limit the size of that Krausen, which can be beneficial in many cases. While it's certainly a valid option to use a Kvike strain in this particular beer, it prevents it from being a British golden ale because you're using a different type of yeast. There is a big difference, in my opinion, between the Kvike strains and the uh, British strains that we're trying to use here. There's a mouthfeel difference, there is definitely an ester difference, and Kvike yeast tends to actually ferment a lot further down. You're gonna get a drier beer out of it than if you were using English ale yeast, and that's gonna throw all the other flavors off a little bit so if that's all you have and that's what you're working with then totally fine just adjust your recipe to account for that maybe mash at a slightly higher temperature that being said i would really recommend using english yeast if you can it's going to make the world of difference for this beer Either way, to summarize, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be fermenting this one at about 68 degrees with Weiss 1968 London ESB, and I'm going to be fermenting for about one to two weeks. We're going to let this one uh, get maybe three to five days after that to clean up any additional uh, yeast-related flavors from the fermentation, like diacetyl, like excessive esters. Uh, and then we're going to cold crash it, knock that yeast out, get this thing to clarify a little bit. We'll naturally carbonate in the keg once it's transferred over, and then I will set it up on the beer engine to serve uh, via hand pull. It's going to be so much fun and I'm excited to see what happens. So I'll catch you guys when it's ready. Fermentation for this beer went astoundingly fast, uh, like ridiculously fast for a non kvike strain. Primary fermentation was totally complete in three days. And then as you can tell from this plot, I couldn't quite believe it. So I confirmed the final gravity not once, but twice uh, until we got to the end of the first week. Regardless, I left it at fermentation temperatures for an additional week to help clean up any off flavors that could have resulted. Uh, and then I added some pressure to the tank and cold crashed for another few days. Uh, at this point, everything dropped out nicely and bright and I transferred into a keg and got it ready for carbonation. Instead of naturally carbonating the entire keg, instead I transferred off a small amount into a mini keg to use on the beer engine and put the rest of it in my kegerator as a regular keg. That mini keg got primed with some priming sugar and hooked up to the beer engine, and that's what we'll be tasting here shortly. The beer is called Keep Calm and Drink On, and it comes in at 5.3% ABV and about 49 IBUs.
This is definitely one of my favorite beers to serve off of the hand pole because we get a really, really good view of the bubbles and the cascade because it is a clear beer, but also because it's a pale beer. And it's really neat to see the clarity of the beer kind of take shape after the bubbles start to work their way out. Um, and it's awesome to watch. So for the appearance of the beer, it is a brilliantly clear gold color. And what's so cool about this is I didn't use any finings whatsoever to clarify the beer. That is all from natural flocculation of the yeast. And that's one of the reasons why I love this strain so much is because you could get that bright of a beer just from keeping it cold for a few days. Serving off of the beer engine builds up a frothy head for a little bit, but after that, unfortunately, the beer has pretty abysmal head retention. Um, even that surface layer disappears after enough time. I think this is due to the beer engine knocking out a lot of the carbonation. The kegged version of the beer does retain its head for a lot longer. All right, so now let's go in for a little aroma. Minus the beer being a little bit light struck just because of the situation that I'm in, I'm nice bright lighting of course, but it is the sun. So that's gonna do things to beer. I do get a lot of maltiness though. I get a lot of really nice kind of, uh, just like crackery, biscuity, uh, very intense maltiness. I also get a little bit of an earthy hop note coming out, but uh, that's really it. A little bit lighter of an aroma on this one, but let's go in for mouthfeel. The mouthfeel in this one, it's super soft, it's super light, and you know, because I pulled it off of a cask, it's really got that nice kind of like roundness and smoothness that you get out of that serving uh, method. Knocking all that carbonation out really allows for the mouthfeel to change and transform, and it's beautiful in the way that it works. Overall, this beer feels to me to be a solid medium bodied ale. It's not super light drinking, but it's definitely not heavy either. Um, and I think it's actually a little bit lighter than most English ales that I've made at least. It feels simultaneously substantial, but also sessionable. Let's go in for flavor though, because this beer is awesome. Mm. I am really happy with the flavor on this. First of all, it's got such a different maltiness to it than most at least American pale ales do, right? Because we're doing this British style and we use Marisada as our base malt, that's a lot more intense. You're getting a lot more biscuitiness out of it, you're getting a lot more intense kind of uh, richer maltiness. It just gives this beer a nice new dimension of malt character and I'm really enjoying that. Hops for this one come through really nicely too. The blend of EKG and Cascade is one that I would absolutely do again without hesitation. This blend is so freaking good. You get like that nice orange character, you get the nice earthiness, the floral elements of uh, EKG, and then that blends again with the floral elements of Cascade, but then you get that little kind of, little touch of cattiness on there, and then um, a really nice grapefruit note at the very end. I would say there's a lot more EKG flavor than Cascade, which is great because it's one of my favorite hops, and it suits this beer perfectly. But then it, it like, evolves and it moves into that Cascade character, which is much more Americanized in something that I'm very familiar with. It's a cool evolution of flavor. And then all the while, it's backed on this really, really solid malt backbone of Maris Otter. And you get that really wonderful biscuit character out of it. It is a fantastic beer. All the while, that yeast background is clean, but you still have a little bit of that English character in it. You have a little bit more body. You have a little bit more smoothness. The way the yeast kind of works around the malts and it pushes that maltiness forward. That's one of the coolest things about this beer is the way the ingredients work together to make it its own style. And, you know, I never thought about like, okay, it's just an American pale ale with British ingredients. Like, no, it's its own style for a reason. It works differently that way. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's super refreshing. It's perfect for spring. And it's like, it's just like one of my new favorite beers. What this does more than anything though for me is bring back some absolutely fantastic memories of when I was on my honeymoon with my wife in London, just doing some pub hopping really in the middle of the summer. These golden nails were everywhere and they were so, so good and half of them were on hand pull. And every single time I saw something on hand pull, I got it and it just, it, it's the same thing. It's so awesome to have that at home 
As far as potential improvements for the spear go, I only have a few. Um, the first is I would like to improve the head retention a little bit. I think a good portion of the reason why it's got no head retention right now is because this is a portion of the beer that I put away to put on cask. The kegged version has got a lot better head retention, but I still wouldn't mind throwing some like some wheat in there just to get a little extra boost in the head retention. And maybe a few character malts. I wouldn't be upset about turning this a slightly darker shade of gold and giving it a little bit of a caramel malt edge. I think a nice British like Crystal 45 kind of thing would be nice in this beer. Just a very light hand of it and it could be great. But otherwise the hop presentation is fantastic. You could dry hop this one too actually and it would turn out pretty nice. So that might be another thing to add to the list. But overall I'm very happy with the beer. Overall it's really everything I wanted out of this beer style and it makes a fantastic spring beer. And it's something that I am so happy I can share with you guys because I don't think there's really that many other videos on British golden ale out there on the internet. So this is a style that is very much alive and well in England. Something that you should absolutely brew yourself and it makes a fantastic beer. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something, and if you did, please go ahead, hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to comment down below with any thoughts, questions, etc. about the beer, uh, the brewing process. I'd be happy to get back to you on those. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can get this design and plenty of others in the merchandise store, which is linked in the description box down below the video. I also have a Patreon, and my patrons are the reason why I can do things like upgrade my production quality with multiple cameras, multiple lenses. All this good stuff is coming from patron funding, so I really appreciate what you've done to help support the channel. It means the world to me. There are other ways to support the channel besides Patreon, though, if you want to do something different. Um, I have channel memberships. I also have the Super Thanks button. You can hit either of those things for a quick and easy way to help donate to the channel. It all goes back into it. It means a lot to me. I also have an Amazon store where you can find uh, all the brewing equipment, all the channel production equipment that I use that's available on Amazon. Check it out if you're curious. There's some good stuff there. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So go check those links out for some more frequent content and some surprises. Anyway, guys, if you're still watching at this point, thank you so much for watching the whole video. It means a lot to me. These things take a long time to put together, and it takes even longer to get these things fit into my busy schedule, especially with a baby running around. So I really appreciate it if you are still watching at this point. And this one goes out to you. So until the next one, cheers. It's <sighs> good beer.